Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and follow such a wonderful talk. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my talk is called Super Architecture, Design for Sustainability and Health. Sorry, Daylight for Sustainability and Health. So I'm going to start this talk about sustainability and health by introducing this house. It's a cure cottage uh, located at Saranac Lake in upstate New York. And um, between 1873 and 1945, um, houses like this and in this area uh, were a renowned center for tuberculosis research and treatment. Um, until antibiotics were developed, staying at a cure cottage was considered highly effective and state of the art. Um, it was known as so-called taking the cure. You go to a place like this, you experience fresh air, daylight, good nutrition, and you, you relax and heal from tuberculosis. And these cure cottages had a distinctive architectural style. Uh, they had <coughs> bedrooms with big windows, they had cure porches with uh, floor-to-ceiling glass and operable walls. Um, so the idea was to have exposure to nature, to fresh air, sunshine, and regardless of the weather, people went outside, and here the building is the cure. So these cure cottages were influenced by sanatorium design. Um, so cure porches like this one, um, they were built around the world during this time period, and cure cottages represented a new kind of architectural typology. It's part hospital, part house, and it allowed a residential setting for healing. So today, however, it's non-communicable diseases that pose the greatest threat to health. So things like heart attacks and strokes, cancer and diabetes, and disability is a leading cause, sorry, <laughs> depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide. So if our buildings influence our emotions and our behavior and our wellness, how can we use buildings to actually improve our mental health? So how can environmental design actually improve our psychosocial health? So what I propose today is that we rethink sustainable architecture and design for climate change to include health promotion and architectural experience. The human dimensions of sustainability must be a priority, and connections to nature and our environment should be considered together with well-being and health in some of the same ways as the cure cottages. And since daylight is a fundamental aspect to architecture, and it's also fundamental to sustainable design and also to human health and well-being, the creative use of natural light offers real opportunities for design to positively benefit many aspects of our lives. And in my talk today, I'm going to introduce three examples of buildings that do more than just be high-performing or environmentally sustainable but also that are designed to be health-promoting and designed to enhance our experience. And I call these buildings super-architecture, meaning buildings that not only make our environment better, but that actually make us better for being in them. Design is more than aesthetics, as we all know, and it, it is a way to interweave our experiences in spaces with the natural world. So, does, so it can it can positively impact our moods, our happiness, and our well-being. So I'm going to start with this example. It's in Vancouver, Canada. It's um, designed to be emotionally supportive. So good architecture can instill a sense of calm and wellness, and it can respond to the human scale. This example by Michael Green Architects is a residential building on a, has on a hospital campus but it looks nothing like a hospital. It allows visiting families to stay while they're visiting a family member who's receiving treatment at the BC Children's Hospital. So the architects designed the building to be home-like, to be playful and non-clinical, and it includes spaces to prepare meals together, 
to eat together as a family, spaces for recreation and leisure. And it tries to balance the needs of privacy and also community during a difficult time. And the architects are known for their innovative approaches to wood. So this building features a tilt-up cross-laminated timber structure that's lightweight and environmentally friendly. And this concept is key to their um, projected lead rating. So this isn't a patient environment per se, but it's designed to be a healthy environment for people with compromised immune systems. So the architects did things like natural ventilation, natural materials throughout the building, and of course, daylight. So architects can use design strategies to make emotionally supportive environments that incorporate environmentally um, sustainable features to actually offer co-benefits to people. So my second example is about daylight. So daylight can be a powerful way to connect people to place. So daylight, whether it's views up or out, um, can connect us to the time of day, the weather, the local conditions on a site. And this example by Mass Design Group is a maternity waiting village located in Malawi where pregnant women arrive a few weeks prior to their delivery so that they can receive medical care. And in Malawi, expectant mothers ex often face long walking distances through mountainous terrain to reach delivery facilities. So this journey prevents them often from receiving care. So the architects, Mass Design Group, designed this facility to be a maternity waiting village. So the design of the facility includes courtyards, a variety of spaces, spaces around the buildings. It's designed to make people want to stay here and they can use the building and its site while still remaining close to the facility. And with the design of the building, the lifted roofs allow cross ventilation, it lets daylight in, and it manages stormwater runoff. And generous overhangs provide shade and shelter for the courtyards and walkways around which the village life takes place. And the architects use an approach they call low fab, which means local fabrication. So they use local materials, local techniques, and local labor. And they find that this actually reduces costs. It has, uh, it builds the economic capacity of the community, and it encourages stewardship, which can sustain a community for years to come. And the architectural details that Mass Design Group does, the details with materials and thresholds and the variety of spaces, are part of why their work is award-winning for their contextual health designs like this one. So passive design strategies like daylight to promote well-being while also reducing the need for electric lighting, roofs with overhangs for shading and comfort to reduce the need for air conditioning. These are all benefits that nature gives us for free. So we need to make better use of these to maximize the positive impacts that superarchitecture can have on people. And now for something completely different. This is um, this is multi-sensory design. So I'm thinking about multi-sensory multi design features that incorporate color and texture and patterns, and also sound and atmospheres and experiences. These can be health-promoting and architecturally inspiring. So this example is by Lions Architects with Conrad Gargett. It's in Brisbane, Australia, and it's a children's hospital that uses evidence-based design principles and concepts of salutogenic design. The idea is to create a healing environment for children and youths. And daylight, in particular roof lights and big windows, help orient visitors and create inspiring multi-sensory spaces. So you can see the, the integrated artwork, the views up and through the building, um, they use natural, tactile materials.
And the impersonal colors and sort of bland decor of a typical hospital have been totally reconsidered here. The architects uh, decided on the colors um, based on clinical and scientific research into color theory. They designed it to be playful and informal, to get people's attention, and to improve wayfinding. And the facade offers inviting and inviting um, architecture and a positive contribution to street level and the wider public realm. The big windows allow framed views to many nearby parks, to the mountains, to the Brisbane River. But they also offer views into the building, which helps to demystify the hospital experience, especially for children. And a series of landscaped roof terraces are used by patients, families, and, and the staff for recreation and therapy programs. So the green roofs provide thermal insulation for the floors below, thereby reducing energy costs. But daylight and natural ventilation are enhanced by the building's double height spaces and the vertical atria inside. And the natural airflow is regulated by louvers on the building's exterior, which are activated in response to ambient conditions. So des designing multi-sensory spaces can mean specifying operable windows to, to hear the birds sing. It can mean creating indoor-outdoor therapy rooms where you can have people be able to feel the grass under their feet. It can, also, it can also be designing waiting areas so you have views across the city. So these design decisions can offer mutually beneficial relationships for people in our experiences and the natural environment. So I've shown three examples of what I call super architecture. These are designs that aim to incorporate the human health and environmental aspects of sustainable design, but not so they just make our environment better, but so they make us better as well. All three of them aim to be emotionally supportive spaces, and they do this in different ways to encourage well-being and reduce stress. And another common thread through the three examples is daylight and fresh air. Since daylight is fundamental to architecture and sustainable design and health, all of my super architectural examples showcase how designers are really using daylight to bring into the building. And a key aspect of designing for people is designing for all of our senses. So not just how a space looks and how it feels to be inside, but also how it feels over time and in different seasons. And as architects, we talk about this all the time, but we don't often explicitly connect human health and well-being to sustainable design. So as I've shown from my historic examples from the Cure Cottages at Saranac Lake, designing for health is really nothing new. We've always wanted to feel better in spaces. And similarly, there's nothing new about sustainable design. Architects have always cared about the environment. But increasingly, with relatively new emphasis on measuring and regulating both sustainable design and also health and well-being, we have to make sure that we realize we have the opportunity to incorporate multiple performance aspects in our design. It's not either or. So super architecture is trying to identify the positive co-benefits of health and well-being and sustainable architecture. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with a few questions. So, the question really is, we can look at sustainability and health as design problems, but what kinds of environments do we want? And we know our surroundings profoundly influence how we behave and how we relate to others. So how do we want buildings to make us feel? Thank you.